Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, happy to tell you a little bit about what, what we do. Uh, so my talk is, is, is chemical space exploration. And, and what I mean by that is uh, the, let's see if I can advance here. Uh, the huge number of, of possible molecules uh, that in principle we should be able to make uh, and study, but in practice, uh, we've only uh, made and tested uh, a tiny, tiny fraction of this. So, so almost all of this uh, chemical space is, is untested. And uh, what I've been working on and many other people are working on is, is how to develop software uh, that can that allow us to, uh, to study this or search this incredibly vast space. Uh, so so is, is that even possible? Well, um, I didn't used to think so, uh, but then uh, things like this came along. Uh, so, so we have this game of Go, which is very, very popular in Asia, and it has um, an unbelievable number of possible moves, much larger than chess. Uh, and yet, uh, through computational approaches, we're able to, uh, well, we've been able to write a program that now can beat the, the grandmasters. Uh, so it, it, the question is, can we use similar approaches, not necessarily the same, but similar to search this in incredibly vast chemical space? Uh, so the fundamental challenge here is we have this, we have this huge space. Uh, we can afford, depending on what kind of property we're looking at, we can afford maybe on the order of a million. Maybe if it's a machine learning model, we can for the, you know, 100 million. If it's quantum chemistry, maybe we can only afford 10,000. Uh, but it's, it's, it's roughly around there. And, and compared to this number here, it's, it's basically all the same, right? So we can afford uh, to evaluate this many molecules out of this many uh, to narrow it down to something where we can start thinking about doing experiments and, uh, or more accurate computations. Um, and to, to find the molecule we want. So to find a molecule with, with new and interesting properties. Uh, and so the, the challenge of course is that since we can only look at a tiny, tiny fraction, how certain can we be that we're actually gonna find anything, anything useful maybe uh, we, since we only uh, search a very, very small or evaluate a very small number, right? Is, is this even, does this even make sense to do it? So there's a couple of uh, methods. Actually, there, there are many, many methods now that purport to search chemical space. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to pick out three here, uh, and I'm going to focus on one. Uh, so one is recurrent neural networks. Uh, so we all know that from from autocomplete, and so basically you you can you can adjust or adapt this to chemistry so that you have an autocomplete for molecules. Uh, so that can either be on the graph level or the, the character level where you're basically uh, making new smile strings uh, that you then convert to molecules and, and evaluate. Uh, there are also uh, another very promising method is autoencoders, uh, where you basically uh, translate your molecule into a vector uh, of numbers. And then you can do what we normally do with vectors of numbers and in, in in automation. Uh, so any of the tricks uh, we know from, from optimization techniques, we could, we could also use them here because we now have an, an, a numerical representation. The trick of course then is once we move around in this latest late, latent space, how do, we, how do we come back to molecular space so we can actually see what molecule the method suggests. Uh, the final one is a little older, uh, but uh, I think it's fair to say now that it's experiencing a somewhat of a renaissance, and that's genetic algorithms, where you use the, the principles of evolution uh, and apply it to molecules. Uh, and so that's, that's the one I want to I wanna focus on here today. So to sort of tell you about what genetic algorithms are and, and, and why it might be useful to, to work with them, I wanna, I wanna sort of step back and take a very, very simple example uh, that's not chemical. Uh, so basically we're gonna, um, we're gonna search a, a similar size space, which is the space of, of sequences, possible sequences uh, of which this is one of them. So this is our target sequence from Shakespeare. 
uh, it has 39 characters uh, or 39 positions, I should say. And, and so if we just limit ourselves to lower space characters, then uh, we have 27 possible possibilities at each point. And so if you, if you work that out, uh, you get something that's roughly the same size as a chemical space. Uh, and so if you, so actually I, I teach a course in, in simulations and Python programming for undergraduates. And they're, you know, in a couple of weeks, they can write a genetic algorithm program that consistently uh, can find this sequence among 10 to the 55 um, possible uh, by considering only at most uh, 50,000 sequences or so, starting from completely randomly generated sequences of characters, right? So, so it, it, it's just considering a tiny, tiny portion of this, and yet it can consistently every single time find this particular sequence out of this total number. And so the question is, how does it do that? And, and the next question is then, does that also apply to, to molecules in chemical space? Uh, and so since it's a simple example, I can sort of use it to, to motivate genetic algorithms. Uh, so we start with what's called an initial population. Uh, and that's typically generated randomly. Uh, so here you can see a couple of random uh, sequences that we generate. Uh, and in the example I'll show you, um, here we, we generate 100 uh, of these sequences. Uh, then we score the sequences, uh, which means we, we somehow to have to attach a numerical sort of indication of how fit these sequences are. And so in this particular case, we just go on and look uh, at each position. Uh, and if, if the correct character is there, we give it a score of one. Uh, so in, particular, in this particular case, the O is here where it should be. So this sequence, that, and that's it. So this sequence only gets a score of one. Here, the N is there, that gets a score of one. Uh, and then we pick sequences based on scores. So basically the, the higher the score, the more likely we are to pick the sequence. And then we perform these mating and crossover uh, evaluations. And this is sort of where this idea of, of evolution comes in. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, a crossover means that we, we pick some random spot in the two sequences, we make a cut, and then we exchange the pieces. Uh, so in this particular case, we, we cut here, combine these two sequences to get a new sequence here. And in this particular case, as you can see, the score goes up uh, to two. And then we also afterwards, with some predefined probability, make a random mutation. So we pick some, uh, some position at random and change it to a random character. So in this particular case, I changed this and I happen to change it to a T. So the, the score goes up again, All right? And then you just repeat this procedure over and over again, or until you're done or you reach some um, certain number of, of uh, target uh, generations. Uh, and so you can see the result here. So what I'm plotting here is uh, the top score that I find in my population of 100 uh, different sequences uh, as a function of generations, right? So here at the, in the beginning in the start population, I may get lucky and have uh, a sequence with, with one or two um, or three maybe even if I'm very lucky, right? And then this mating and mutation, as you can see, uh, increases um, the, the score quite rapidly uh, until you get up to sort of here and then it starts to, to flatten out a little bit. But even here uh, in the longest running one, right? We're still around uh, 500 generations. And for each generation, we uh, score a hundred sequences. So, you know, this is where this, this 50,000 comes from. And this, so here are 10 different genetic algorithm simulations starting from 10 different initial starting populations. And, and, and you can see we converge every time. We find the sequence every time, even though the space is huge. And so the reason we do this, so this is why I picked a simple example where you can actually sit down and do some, some math um, is that you, you can show that in your initial population, 77% of the initial population um, on average has at least one possible character place correct. 
Uh, so you're very likely, so if you have a population of 100 uh, sequences on average, 77 of them is gonna have at least one character placed correctly. And that means you can, when you then take these and combine them, the score is very, very likely to go up. And, and so that's why it works. Uh, yes, the amount that the, the space um, that we have to search is huge, but most of the space, most of these 10 to the 55 sequences have at least one characters placed correctly just by random chance. And so we're very likely to find these. Uh, so, so this is sort of the, 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 the picture uh, you, have to, you have to keep in your mind, right? You, you're in a huge space, um, but if you just go into your space at a random position, you're very, very likely to uh, hit a path, right? So the space is huge, but it's suffused with paths that all lead you to your target molecule or, or your target sequence, uh, right? So, so, so no matter sort of where you start in chemical space here, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna land on a path and then the genetic algorithm or the machine learning uh, search algorithm, right? Will then follow the path uh, to the target. And so that, that's why it works every time. Uh, of course, things are a little bit more complicated with molecules, um, but this is the general idea. So, so we need to, so if you wanna do this for molecules, we need new mating uh, and mutation operations. Uh, and so inspired by some, some, some older work here, uh, I wrote some, some open source codes that, that, that does this. Uh, so there are some mating operations. Uh, you have two parents, uh, you cut at some random spot in each molecule, and then you recombine the fragments, right? So for example, here I cut here, here I cut here, and then I combine these two fragments to make this molecule and this two fragments to make this molecule. And then, then you can put in some rules. Um, you don't want molecules that are too small. These are not really good sort of children to work from. Um, you can also, and, and this one is fine, or you can, you can also do this in rings. So for example, here I, I cut here, right here I cut here, and then I combine the two uh, to make new rings. Uh, and so you have similar operations for mutations where you just go in, add or delete an atom, uh, make a ring, break a ring, something like that. So it's, it's possible to do this kind of uh, mating and mutation operations also for molecules. Uh, so how well does this work? Uh, so, so now I'm gonna show you uh, a couple of examples uh, where we're trying to optimize different kinds of properties to sort of get a feel for how difficult it is and, and for how often it works. Uh, so in this particular case, here we want to find molecules that absorb at a particular wavelength uh, with a certain oscillator strength. Uh, so, so usually what, what sets one genetic algorithm search off from another is, is really just the, the target and the score. Uh, and so here I've, you, can, you can optimize two or more properties at once uh, by, my, by making a composite score. In this particular case, uh, our, our score has two contributions, one from the wavelength, absorption wavelength. And here, I just picked a target of 400 uh, nanometers. So, so this will have its, its maximum score if the absorption wavelength is 400. Uh, and then we also want a, a, an oscillator strength that's reasonably high. So I picked uh, 0 0.3. As sort of, again, sort of an arbitrary thing. We're happy with anything above 0 0.3. And so then you can use this, this type of, uh, of, of functional form here. That's a maximum um, and stays a maximum as soon as the oscillator strength is, is higher than 0 0.3. And then you can combine the two. Uh, and so, so that's what we did. Uh, we started with, uh, I believe here, the population size is just 20. So we picked 20 random molecules uh, and, and then to sort of make it a little bit difficult for ourselves, right? We, we threw away molecules uh, that absorbed uh, between 300 and 500 nanometers. So that we really, you know, we wanna challenge our genetic uh, algorithm score here. 
so, so we did that. So there are, there are 20 random molecules to start with, but they're not actually, they're less than random. They're sort of worse, worse than random, uh, if you can put it like that. Uh, and now we have to sort now we have to estimate uh, the wavelength, absorption wavelength and the oscillator strength. And so in this particular case, we do it with a semi-empirical quantum mechanical method, uh, tight binding method. So we, uh, every time we make a new molecule, uh, we generate the three-dimensional coordinates. We do a quick, very quick crude conformer search. Uh, and then we take the, with molecular mechanics force field, we take the lowest energy one, and then we evaluate uh, the absorption spectrum quantum mechanically for that. And of course, you can, depending on your computational resources, you can also do this at the DFT level. You can do a more thorough conformational search. This was just sort of a proof of concept. And so what you see here is, is a similar plot to the one I showed before. So this is 10 different runs. Actually, I believe this is 20 different runs. Um, highest, highest scoring molecule per, pop, uh, per generation. Right, that the maximum is two. Uh, so this has a maximum score of one and so does this. So the maximum is two and you can see you reach that uh, super fast, uh, more, usually within 10 generations, right? So you basically considered only 200 uh, molecules per run. Uh, and so that actually seems much easier than this, uh, this string, this Shakespeare example I showed you. And, and part of the reason is that there is more than one solution. There, there are many molecules that have an absorption uh, maximum around 400 nanometers, right? So, so, so not only uh, is your space suffused with paths, but you actually have many, many families of paths that leads to different targets here that all have um, uh, the same absorption properties, right? So, so it becomes uh, an easier problem actually than, the, than finding one particular one. Uh, so here are some of the molecules, uh, some of the highest scoring molecules. So, so what you see here is the absorption wavelength uh, and the oscillator strength here, right? So this should be close to 400 and this should be above 0 0.3. Uh, and so usually that, that's the case. Uh, you can see uh, we often get very, very close. Uh, sometimes you get a little further away that's, that's not because the genetic algorithm search fails. It's, it's because uh, this is a, a molecule with a lot of different conformations. Uh, and so when we reevaluate the uh, absorption properties uh, after genetic algorithm run, we, we end up with a different conformer because we don't do a very good conformer search. And, and these conformers have different uh, absorption properties. So it's not really that the genetic algorithm fails, it's that we're not uh, in, in for mo molecules like that doing the scoring uh, carefully enough, right? But for small molecules with very few rotatable bonds, right, we're, we're spot on. Uh, so if there, if there are any real chemists in the audience, so, so synthetic chemists, you may notice that some of these molecules, actually a lot of these molecules, to be honest, uh, look a little strange, uh, perhaps a little unstable. Uh, we have a lot of, for example, uh, a lot of cyclopentadienes, which you don't see normally because they tend to uh, polymerize uh, in solution at high concentrations. Uh, and there are also some, uh, yeah, some maybe some unusual uh, heterocyclic rings that you don't see very often because they're not very stable. Uh, and so this is, this is uh, sort of one thing uh, that is a particular problem for genetic algorithms compared to machine learning is that they don't really, you're only going after the score. It doesn't really, hasn't learned anything about chemistry and how molecules look like. Uh, and so if you, don't, if you don't adjust your score to address this problem, you can get some pretty strange looking molecules. Uh, that does also happen in machine learning uh, methods, but to a lesser extent. So, so what can you do about that? So here, um, here's another uh, optimization problem. So here, instead of uh, finding a molecule with a particular, that absorbs at a particular wavelength, uh, we're now looking for molecules that have good docking scores. So we use the, the glide docking score uh, to evaluate. That gives you a negative value. The more negative it is, the better. Uh, and, but 
other than that, we use the same type of approach. We start with, uh, here the population size is 400. So we start with 400 random molecules. We usually take it, take it from the zinc database, uh, but you could also take it from other databases. Uh, we run for 50 generations uh, and uh, we run two, uh, 20 separate genetic algorithm searches. And, and so if you, just, if you just focus on the docking score, if that's the only thing that determines the score, uh, you end up uh, with molecules like this that have a very good docking score. So for those who are not familiar with it, that is typically a docking score, you know, less than let's say minus nine is considered very good. Um, this is minus 13. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a very, very respectable docking score. Uh, so, 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 so that works, but if you look at the molecule, of course, it's, it's completely ridiculous. Um, probably, <laughs> probably explosive, um, but certainly not a molecule you can make. Uh, so, so then we um, experimented with, with uh, two ways, actually three ways in the end of improving the synthetic accessibility or the sort of the stability of the molecules. So in one way, we, we, we simply found a set of filters uh, developed by uh, drug discovery companies. So these are basically a list of, of functional groups that are unstable uh, or undesirable in some way. And then we, we basically just, just throw these away at every generation. Uh, and if you do that, I think things improve somewhat. Uh, they're still a little bit strange looking, but certainly uh, a lot more reasonable than this. You still get your cyclopentadiene. Uh, so another uh, thing we tried is a, uh, another method uh, that, can, that can basically give you a synthetic accessibility score. Uh, so, so this is an even larger set, that in this case of desirable fragments. So you've basically done an analysis of molecules that are already synthesized and, and, and you found fragments that are there. And so the more fragments of that kind you find, right, the, the, the better your score, the higher the, uh, the synthetic, or yeah, the lower the score, but the higher the synthetic accessibility is. Uh, and so if you include that in your scoring function, you get molecules like this, which are now starting to look uh, very reasonable. And if you combine the two, uh, you now start getting molecules like that, uh, which are, are very reasonable looking. I'll, I'll come back to sort of more um, evidence for this. So, so if, you, if you include synthetic accessibility measures in your scoring function, you can solve this problem of, of generating uh, weird looking uh, molecules, uh, but you can still get good docking scores. Uh, okay, so here's, a, here's an example where we use uh, this approach here. Um, and so we run this uh, set of genetic algorithm searches. Uh, we use two different protein uh, targets. Uh, and this is the number of molecules we find uh, with docking scores less than uh, nine or less than 10 um, respectively. Uh, so in this particular case, we find 10 molecules out of a, a, a final population um, of uh, 8,000, right? So 400 for every genetic run, uh, genetic algorithm search times 20. Um, and for this, we find with uh, 38 molecules uh, with a dark score less than minus 10. Now, how, how good is that? Well, if you just uh, take uh, the SYNC database, actually this is a subset of about 250,000 molecules. So if you just do sort of a standard virtual high throughput screening, uh, you only find one molecule as opposed to 10 uh, with a docking score of less than 10 for this particular target. And here you only find eight. Uh, right, so you find significantly more molecules with good docking scores uh, using the genetic algorithm search. Okay, but are they synthetically accessible? Well, so in, in this particular case, we used a, a sort of more complex, uh, more, I would say more accurate uh, measure of synthetic accessibility. This is from a company called Molecule One, uh, where they actually go in and sort of do a retrosynthetic analysis of the molecule rather than looking just for the presence and absence of fragments. 
Uh, and so, the, so then you get a score uh, between uh, one and 10, lower is better. Uh, and, and they have some cutoff for what uh, they, uh, so, so 10 is non-synthesizable. Anything below that is synthesizable uh, it, it, according to this uh, program here. And as you can see, 76% uh, uh, of the final population, so 76% of the 8,000 molecules you gen regenerate uh, are judged to be synthetically accessible uh, for this target, and here is 88. Uh, and so if you compare that uh, to the same numbers for the sync data set, which for the sync data set, th these molecules have in principle been made already. Um, so if this, if this program was working 100% correctly, they should in principle uh, be 100% synthesizable because in fact they have been, they have been made. So, so you can see the numbers here uh, are the same, basically. It's a little higher here for this target. It's a little lower here for this target, uh, but basically the same. Uh, and to sort of get a, a second opinion, oh, oh, well, I'm skipping my head on myself here. So, so, so here are some of the molecules you get. This is the one I, I showed um, before. Uh, what you have here, you have three numbers. You have the docking score. Uh, you have, this is the a similarity score relative to this molecule. So for this molecule, that's one. Uh, but for this molecule, this is the similarity score of this molecule to this molecule. Uh, and then you have this uh, molecule one synthetic accessibility score, right? Where, where anything less than 10 is good, the lower, the better. Um, and so, so what you can see here is you, you get a lot of molecules with good docking scores, right? So they're all less than 10. You get a very diverse set of molecules. So it's not just that it's, it's suggesting this molecule with different sort of substituents here over and over again, right? It's giving you many, many different structural motifs that all give you a good docking score uh, to this particular target. And you can see that by the Tani motor score, right? So there's, uh, I think, yeah, this one is the closest thing you can really get to this, right? And these two are, are clearly very, very different. And uh, with one exception uh, for, for this set here, right? They're all, uh, they should all be synthetically accessible. So this one was judged synthetically inaccessible right, one out of 10, but the rest uh, have fairly low scores, which is good. Uh, and we can, so if you take this molecule again and then give it to yet another retrosynthesis program, right, just to get a, a, a second opinion. Uh, so here we use Manifold uh, from Prostera. Uh, here's the molecule here. And in fact, it, it, this program predicts that you can make this molecule uh, from, from two building blocks that you can purchase uh, in one step. Uh, with a simple uh, Suzuki coupling reaction, right? So, so, so the molecules are also, um, at least to a first approximation, uh, quite synthesizable. So appropriate properties, a diverse set, so you get many ideas and a lot of them you can actually make or should be able to make. Uh, final example. Um, so this is a catalyst design. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, now we want to minimize uh, the rate determining barrier, uh, which in this particular case is this uh, barrier right here. So that's uh, going from here to here. Uh, this is the, so in this particular case, uh, this reaction is catalyzed by a tertiary amine. Uh, you can see some, some known examples here. And so the goal is really to find tertiary amines starting from completely random tertiary means uh, that have barriers that are comparable or better to known catalysts. And so again, how do you calculate the score? Well, in order to calculate the score, you need to estimate the barrier and, and you need to estimate it relatively quickly, right? Because you, know, uh, you have to do it for every molecule in, in, in the population for every generation. Uh, so we estimate it, uh, again, using tight binding uh, and uh, through sort of an, an, an interpolative path. Uh, if you um, want more information about that, there's, there's a paper here. But basically we start, um, we generate, so our genetic algorithm generates a tertiary mean. 
then we generate these two structures here, which are models of the, the two intermediates um, here and here. And then we interpolate between these two structures here, first a rough interpolation, and then a more fine-grained interpolation here at the energy maximum. And then we take uh, the, the, the top point on this curve, um, that's the energy here. We also compute the energy of the free catalyst plus the reactants, take the energy difference and that's the barrier. Um, and so if we do that, uh, starting from a set of random, again, from the zinc database tertiary means, uh, you run a uh, population size of 50 for 30 generations. Uh, and you end up with molecules like that, which has a significantly lower energy difference. Now, this is in principle a barrier. It's negative uh, because this is only the electronic energy uh, contribution. Uh, here we computed at the DFT level using uh, the, the tight binding uh, description of the, trans of the structure of the transition state or the barrier height. Uh, it's lacking entropy uh, contributions, which would make this positive again, right? But our assumption here is that these energy uh, cont uh, entropy contributions mainly come from, from going from three molecules to one, right? And so it's, it's, our assumption is that that's constant. We can, of course, check that uh, subsequently for the final population. Um, and so just for comparison, the, the corresponding energy difference or, or barrier heights and quotation marks for a known catalyst right, is 8.3. So we have roughly uh, the same uh, energy difference here. And so our prediction would be that this would be an equally good catalyst compared to this. Uh, but we found it completely automatically from a, a, a random starting position. And so we now have some exper experimental collaborators at the University of Copenhagen who are trying to uh, to make some of these molecules uh, and to test whether that's true. Okay, so so that's that's all I have. Uh, what are we what are we working on now? Uh, so many different things. So 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 one sort of a general um, challenge, right? Is is we want to be as efficient as possible so that we can use um, better and better scoring functions. So for example, if we can get this number down. Uh, then perhaps you could use DFT instead of tight binding uh, for some of these calculations. Uh, and that would open things up to, to more applications and, and, and likely um, increase the success rate. Uh, another thing is to combine genetic algorithms and machine learning. So, so maybe not worry so much about what this value is, um, but instead uh, building machine learning models that could quickly estimate it rather than doing uh, the quantum mechanical uh, calculations at every point in the genetic algorithm search. And you can sort of com imagine combining the two so that you, you start uh, with a model, uh, you run for a few uh, generations, then do a reality check with quantum mechanics, uh, refit your machine learning methods, letting it do a few more generations with that and, and, and iterate like that. So that's one thing we're looking at. And of course, the, the, in all of this, uh, uh, right, what we really, what's really needed in the field, there's some experimental validation uh, of some of these predictions uh, to see if they actually work. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That's all I have. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions.